So, Nietzsche and Wagner. This one goes back to 1813. That's the year Richard Wagner was born. That's also the year Karl Nietzsche, that's Friedrich Nietzsche's daddy, that's the year he was born. So Wagner and Nietzsche, they always had this kind of father-son thing going on. All right, 1844, Friedrich Nietzsche was actually born, and by this time, Wagner's operas, uh, Rienzi, Flying Dutchman, they'd, they'd been premiered. And uh, 1848, Nietzsche, he's now learning how to read. Big deal. And Wagner gets excited. He doesn't get excited. Well, he gets pretty excited, but then he gets exiled uh, from Germany. And he starts playing the ring cycle. 1860, that's the year Nietzsche began growing his mustache. And also in 1860, uh, Nietzsche, he was 16, and he and his buddies, two of his buddies from high school, they were like, let's start a fraternity. And they called it Germania, because they were fascists. And uh, the gist of it was that they pulled all their money together to buy a freaking score for Tristan and his older, the, the piano reduction. Opera hadn't even been performed yet. These freaking psychotic teenage krauts bought the piano reduction to an opera that no one had even heard. The uh, point is that Wagner had his little tentacles in Nietzsche's tiny little brain at a pretty early age. And then you jump ahead, 1868. I got a way better motorcycle. Jump ahead, 1868, Nietzsche and Wagner, they finally meet in the flesh, person to person, mustache to neck beard, after a concert in Leipzig. And spring the next year, 1869, little old baby Nietzsche, sweet baby Nietzsche, was appointed professor of classical philology at the University of Basel. He was 24 years old, and his mustache was coming along, you know? Probably could have been a fireman if he wanted to. And then uh, Basel, you know, this town of Switzerland, not far from Lucerne, another town in Switzerland, and Wagner, he was living in Lucerne. And, and Nietzsche, he came over for dinner a couple times, and the two of them, they really bonded over their two favorite things, Schopenhauer and Richard Wagner. Yeah, so pretty soon Nietzsche was coming over all the time to hang, and they just gave him his own room. Because there's so much, like, ah, you're gonna come crash? You don't even need to, we're not even gonna clean up after you, we'll just give you your own room. And then, uh, things are going pretty good. Pretty good, you yeah, know, they're, they're buds. They're happy, friends, and, um, they got what they wanted from each other. Nietzsche, he was able to just bask in the glow of Wagner. Wagner's pretty cool. And Wagner, he got a absolute stooge who would do anything he asked him to. He'd pick up groceries, he'd like, travel around the country to get chocolate and buy silk underwear. And uh, Wagner got Nietzsche to edit his autobiography for him and write a bunch of propaganda and write speeches and stuff to raise money for Bayreuth. It was a pretty sweet deal for old Dick Wagner. 1872, Nietzsche wrote the birth of tragedy. This was a big deal. Nietzsche was, you know, a philology guy, cool guy, you know, like a classicist, we might call him. And, uh, this was his first book, first big book, and it's pretty much no footnotes, no scholarship whatsoever. He just he just goes and says that uh, Socrates and Greek philosophy killed Greek tragedy and ruined Greek culture and ruined Western civilization and that Wagner was going to be the savior who was going to come in and fix it all up and make tragedy great again. Bold take. You know, <clears throat> bold take and uh, Nietzsche, yeah, he pretty much got canceled for it. He, he didn't get fired, you know, uh, but he didn't get hired, never got hired again. He, he kind of destroyed his academic career, just ran it into the ground just to say how much he loved Wagner. Right after the birth of tragedy, things kind of, kind of began to go south. Yeah, you know, Nietzsche was still writing articles, still writing speeches to help Wagner raise money for his big old festival at Bayreuth. 
but uh, from his journals we know that he's getting kind of pissed off a little a little bit of friction there with his uh, favorite dude uh, Wagner you know the Wagners they moved to Bayreuth in 1872 that didn't help long distance definitely put a strain on the relationship and then 1876 that's the ring the the year the that's the ring the year cycle premiered In 1876, the ring cycle premiered. And Nietzsche he was disenchanted with it and really just didn't like it very much. I think it was quite. Uh, Siegfried got all kind of weak and like a real little pussy, and, and then um, he was just kind of distant and alienated from everything going on in Bayreuth. And, Later that fall, you know, Nietzsche and Wagner, they met for the last time, they'd been buddies, and then all of a sudden they weren't buddies anymore. And that's pretty much it, you know, from there on out, Nietzsche was, he was in a full-on polemical tirade against Wagner, and, uh, until the day he died. Ecce Homo, the case of Wagner, the Antichrist, Zarathustra, genealogy of morality, you name it, Nietzsche wrote it, it either has direct or indirect shots at Wagner.